here with my uh i think biggest interview ever which is super exciting and with yeah i've had a lot of like australian and uh people from new zealand like that kind of area um on this podcast and maybe the most infamous or famous um new zealand new zealand rocker of all mr ruben of unknown mortal orchestra how are you um i'm well thanks <laughs> how are you <laughs> i'm good and um I guess, are you enjoying your little holiday? Yeah, it's nice. I mean, I just got here. I'm in Palm Springs at the moment. Um, nice. It's my son's birthday, and we're just kind of hanging out. Yeah. Happy birthday. Doing some stuff. <laughs> well, I, I wish him a, birth a happy birthday, and I hope his day went, you know, a little better than he usually does. <laughs> um, I, I want to start this off by... Uh, just giving a little bit of, I guess, context, right? You're the the super interesting thing about your songwriting and your your music is that it's got a crap load of backstory. That's like the one thing I've noticed. You know, like everything's so intertwined and it's beautiful how everything has got its own meaning and nothing is uh, shallow. And you know, you see other artists have filler songs and stuff. You don't see that with this band. So a lot of the questions, I'm, I don't know if you expect, if you wanted this, but a lot of the questions are going to be like <laughs> based on some songs and stuff. But um, yeah, okay. Something that's really. I hope been, I remember what they're about. <laughs> yeah, if not cool. And uh, so something that's been interesting, who that's been interested, interesting to me and to other fans is Layla and Nadja. How are those songs yeah. intertwined? Because like the music videos are, um, I guess, connected. And then on Spotify, I was just listening to Nadja and there's two girls on like a motorcycle or something. Is that mm -hmm. Layla and Nadja? Uh, yeah, I guess that's the, the concept. Um, part of it is collaborating with um, Vera Lata. Um, I guess it's like, a, uh, I don't, I don't know if I've named the song out like after a girl before, like a girl's name. I can't I can't remember if I'm correct with that, but um, you know, I just uh, have ne had never done that before. And then on this album, there's there's two. Um, so I suppose those songs came together in that way, um, and the kind of concept. For, was to kind of combine those two songs and, um, and kind of played around with different ideas about how to join them together. And I didn't want to force um, my ideas about what the video should be on the directors. Like I like to um, leave the director like free to do what they want to do, but at the same time, sometimes um, Sometimes having like nothing at all, like just ma making no comments at all can be like equally annoying if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. when you're collaborating with someone and you sort of go like, it's like when you ask somebody like, what do you want to have for dinner? And then they say, oh, anything. It's like not really that helpful, you know? You kind of need some something to go by. Like if somebody says like, oh, what about some pasta? But maybe then it gives you something to work with. So I suppose I did my equivalent of, um uh, same pasta <laughs> by kind of talking about um how it might be good to for it to be about a um about two characters like centered around two people that are interacting um Layla is about um is sort of based on my thoughts about my mother leaving Hawaii kind of like imagining kind of a narrative around that um, I usually don't write narrative um, songs. Like I don't, I, I usually write my songs about things that have happened to me and then kind of turn, create a narrative around that. But with this, it was like the, just like a exercise and like imagining uh, somebody else, you know, like a um, kind of like making a little movie in my head about my mum sort of, fleeing Hawaii or whatever and um and her brother also um left Hawaii um different circumstances and stuff but I kind of combined them together to kind of like as a way of inspiring me it's sort of a song about like escape you know escaping where you're from 
Um, and then Nadia is a bit more as kind of typical UMO song where I'm kind of like being cryptic about things um, that have happened to me or conversations that I've had. And, um, you know, taking a, a lot of the songs that I write, maybe like love songs, taking kind of like maybe pith pithy comments or texts or or things that happen, like kind of taking them out of context and then placing them on their own in the song and then um, and then seeing if they're interesting, you know? Um, and hopefully there's like, you know, it's it's like a confessional or it's like truthful, but at the same time taken out of context that makes it kind of mysterious at the same time, if that makes sense. No, it does. And I think you did it extremely well, you know, in context of the song. It is super, I guess, misplaced, but it's perfect. It really is. And um, wow, that is super interesting in the, the way you described that. Did you enjoy writing it from a different perspective? Is that something we'll see again in future projects? Yeah, I think I, think I used to be really um, TMI, like <laughs> about um, the way that I would explain the context of where songs can come from, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I kind of don't really like that as much these days because I, I I want privacy and I used to not really care about that and um it's sort of a threshold of well no you know like if you're super obscure there's a, like a level of obscurity where you can kind of confess whatever you want and nobody cares because you're because you're just this new band and nobody listens to you but then there's I think there's like a, a point where you kind of get Past that like ultra obscurity and to where I am now, which is just normal obscurity. <laughs> and then, um, and then it's just too, a bit too public, you know? Um, and so I've become, you know, from like after multi love, which is the third album, um, the last two albums of, um, the fourth album was, uh, sex and food. And the fifth one is called V and those two, you know, I kind of um, wrote the songs without providing a huge amount of like biographical context for them. And I think that makes you, you your career suffers a little bit, I think, because people like the juicy details of like what a song is about. But I just kind of realized like at some point you've given enough, like you've given people enough. You don't have to tell them like some kind of um, salacious story for every song whether the story's there or not if that makes sense um so so yeah i think the thing is just to kind of like try and find a story for the album without kind of telling everybody your business you know what i mean because i think feel like i give them the song and the song is really for other people it's um i suppose the other artistic thing about it is um if you hear a song and it, and it makes sense to you in your life, then that's more important than, than it becoming about me. Cause I don't really want the song to be about me. I want it to be about you. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah it's yeah, like, yeah. I want, I want, I want the song to be yours. Like when you listen to it on the way to work or, or, um, or whenever just walking around or, or whatever context you're listening to the song, I want it, to cross over from being about me to being about you. So that's the process, you know? And if the story, if I get too specific about the context of the song and what made it, made um, me write the song, I think that that tends to become too big of a deal. And then, um, especially if it's quite dramatic, then people, just feel like, oh, this is that song about him and how he went through this. Um, and then it stops, kind of resists that point where, you, where you're like, oh, he's singing about my life that I'm going through right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, like TMZ, like the paparazzi, like you don't yeah, want yeah, yeah, yeah. All, that, yeah. all that juicy details out on you. And um, yeah. <laughs> from the fans perspective i think it's cooler like when you look through your instagram there's a bunch of cool like vintage photos and it's super mysterious and weird and um unknown right but that's what makes it cool and like 
for album releases. I love it when bands are just going to either spring it on you or just like give a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you don't know what's going on, and then bam, album. It's great. It's awesome. And it's, it makes it feel more like, like you said, like my album, like my song, rather than a commercial, you know, like I wrote it to make some money, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like I don't, it's not like I'm going out of my way to be super cryptic or anything, but at the same time, you know, like the way that the things that I like, you know, I like things that have space, uh, space to, you know, they, they don't kind of like hold your hand through the whole thing. I, I like, I enjoy that. So that's the the way that I make things. That's the way I do, you know, like the Instagram is just a bunch of pictures taken by um, people. And my, my only rule now is that I prefer all of the pictures to be on film. And that's just kind of like an arbitrary rule that I've, that I sit, but within the boundaries of that, it's like a lot of people that I know shoot film and if they give me a picture and they're like, oh, hey, here's a picture that I took on tour or, or it's a picture um, that I took um, of you or, or whatever, um, then I just post what I receive. Kind of, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I like this picture, so I'm going to post that. And, and the way that the story comes together, it's like there's a lot of room for you to kind of use your imagination and um, and if somebody's imagination of what my life is like is more interesting than what it's really like, then I don't want to ruin that by <laughs> kind of like, you know, because I think people are too, um, you know, it's like a lot of stuff on social media these days is just kind of uh, attempting to demystify everything. Um, and a lot of it is kind of like uh, it's it's too explicit. It's it uh, destroys like mystique and at the same time is a lie. If, you know what I mean? It's like uh, people are kind of showing too much of who they are and what their life is like. At the same time, it's not real. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's the worst of both worlds. I'd rather it be, the, the ideal would be um, for the mystique to be um, intact and then at the same time, uh, my life, if you knew more about it, is, is more interesting than the social media rather than less, you know. Um, and and that's, then that leaves me my interesting life in private. And then it also um, gives people the most powerful kind of art. You know? Yeah, they get to paint their own pictures which is mm -hmm. super smart, you know? And um, the film, uh, like, it's funny because I've been getting into film cameras. It's so mm -hmm. organic. That's what I love about it. I hate that. And I was talking about this with a um, with an artist yesterday, right? Like, why would we purposely put music through a computer and get the same thing out or have to, like, artificially change it? And same with pictures, yeah. right? You have, like, a, uh, what's it, like a 2D image of you on stage, right? Or we can get yeah. a beautiful tape machine and get it all mangled up and screwed up but it's more yeah. like organic and with the film yeah. it looks shitty sometimes it looks terrible sometimes but i love that yeah. and it's with music it's yeah. it's more real and that helps me like as a musician quote unquote right that helps me because then i'm like well then if he can screw up i can screw up and that's okay and then <laughs> you know and, yeah. and in the same sense with pictures if i if i take a shoddy picture but then a known mortal orchestra put a shoddy picture up on their Instagram, then, well, okay, <laughs> maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was. And, you know, just that yeah. um, humanization. And it's so important mm -hmm. to music. And it's so important yeah. in life. And we see that, like, through your music, I definitely see the humanization. It's, it's nice to see. It really is. And uh, speaking of food, like pasta, what do you, what do you like to eat? <laughs> <laughs> Um, at the moment, I, I eat everything because um, I, I went through like a, a vegan phase, and then when pandemic hit, I just kind of, for some reason, my that didn't survive pandemic. So I don't know. I, I, I like cooking when I'm not on the road. Um, when we're on the road as well, like we're very into, you know, some of the guys are in the band are like really into wine and. I'm, I don't really know anything about wine, but you know, some of us into beer and like different boozes, and then, and then also like we're into like trying to find interesting or 
delicious food. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm actually um, making uh, pasta sauce tonight. <laughs> My family, and uh, I don't know what have I, what have I been making. I made a uh, chassis pork last week, Ooh. like right before we left, and um, I made. Um, I make steaks a lot these days. Oh, I love a good um, steak. You know, stuff like that. And I'm, you know, and, you know, like a steak and mashed potatoes, you know, making that perfectly, it's really good. Mm -hmm. um, I, and also I kind of like try to find the best spots um, to eat. You know, like a friend of mine showed me, it was like a, the taco challenge, like who makes the best tacos in Portland. And um, there's a place called La Cuchada, which is like, it's a little cart run by um, a lady, and I think it's a um, an older lady and her kids, her two, her daughter and her son. I think I didn't ever ask them um, what their relation is, but they it seems to be the setup, and they make um, incredible tacos and tortas and um, and uh, what are those things called? Um, uh, <laughs> well, this thing's made with masa, and they've got like um, tamales. Tamales, yeah, yeah. they make <laughs> they they always have. I can't remember why I couldn't think of it. They always make um, they always have tamales there, mm -hmm. which is pretty rare in Portland. Not many places, not many uh, Mexican food places have tamales. Like, they always have tamales and like multiple like different versions of it. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I could talk about food. A lot. I really like food. I feel like it's something, you know, makes you happy. Oh, yeah, for sure. And it's funny because, like, music is kind of like a, a really good pasta. Like, you got to have that al dente, like the perfectly chewy, good sauce. Like, I go for a freddo or red sauce, depending <laughs> on the night. But, like, you know, the yeah. perfect sauce. Um, if you're in Atlanta, which I'm sure you will be in the coming years or whatever, there's a taco joint called Mr. Taco. And it's, okay. like, kind of kind of dingy, kind of... Like they give massive things of like mango juice. It's their okay. food's incredible. Like you have really good tacos, pretty salty, like salivating. It's right next yeah. to the Olive Garden. If you, <laughs> but yeah, yeah that's cool. It's nice to hear about Atlanta. Like the... Atlanta's a great food town. I really, oh yeah, for sure. Really like uh, really like Atlanta. I really like um, had some great uh, like soul food there is good. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I went. I, this is actually this um, last time we were there. Somebody told me that there there was a Australian place, a Australian pie place, and then um, they sent some pies to like meat pies, you know, like yeah, 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 like yeah. we have in New Zealand, and um, and they said yeah, it's like an Australian place, and then I, as soon as I I tried the pie, um, I was like, this is not Australian, this is New Zealand, <laughs> and then um, it turned out it was right, like uh, the guy, the guy's New Zealand, I was like. I just knew as soon as I tasted the pies, I was like, this guy's a Kiwi. I, I know that this is like a New Zealand pie. Then so they met this is like the best uh meat pies in in America are at um as part of I know are in Atlanta. The place called Heaps Pies. I'll write that down. It's pretty good. <laughs> I appreciate it, yeah. And uh, in, in Auckland recently. Oh yeah, it's yeah, and it seems like Atlanta. You could just you keep keep discovering new places every day. Mm -hmm. uh, Portland's kind of like that too, actually. Portland is really for a long time it was known for being a, like a good foodie spot or whatever, and I, I just wasn't really convinced. Um, but over the last uh, three years, it's been like I feel like it's kind of come into its own, like living up to the reputation um, lately. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've uh, I think uh, we, I went for a family reunion up in Portland, like three years ago. My first time flying okay. that far away. It's yeah. just like like the cliffside when you're right next to the beach and it's kind of rainy and it's just it really is picture perfect, honestly. But yeah, mm. I for me the the highlight was seafood. You know, like the seafood there was pretty damn oh, good. Yeah. yeah, out to the coast you get a lot. Of, that's where you get all this like Dungeness crabs and and all oh, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's some good seafood out there for sure. I think crab would be my ultimate, um, the thing I enjoy the most out there. Yeah. 
Oh, that's hard. Amazing. Hmm. I mean, I, I like crab, but I don't really eat it often because I'm a steak lover. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I love some well, salmon. Well, it's a surfing too, almost. I know, yeah. You know? Like, <laughs> my thing is, like, seafood is so expensive. Like, I can get some oh, ground yeah. beef for, like, really cheap and then make some delicious yeah. food. But seafood is yeah. damn expensive. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, that's not always in the budget, but that's true. Yeah. I love a good steak. <laughs> We're going to mm-hmm. spend the whole time just talking about food. Um, <laughs> we can do that. Oh yeah. I mean, sure. I, I think it's like, uh, I think it's pretty similar. Like I think cooking, although I don't think I'm like, a gr- like the great world's greatest cook or anything, but I do <laughs> find that cooking is, um, cooking is similar to making music to me. Cause I do feel like, a lot of what I do, like I like using different um, equipment and reamping and all the things that I do with some electric and like marinating and things like that. Like the <laughs> the kind of food that I make, it's a lot of stuff where I like to prepare it the the day before, you know, and then and then kind of like do another stage like the next day and stuff like that. And I, it it does end up kind of being similar, like a. And I've I talked to my bandmates and stuff about that and um uh Jake, the bass player um in the band, like he he's a pretty big he's pretty into cooking as well and I feel like he we have a lot of conversations about like the similarities between you know, it gets like super nerdy because you kinda like try something out. And you think next time I'm gonna do it like this and kind of slowly improve and improve and improve. So it's fun that way. So and it's uh, the thing about, and it's similar in the sense that you're you're making it for some someone, you know. Yeah. Like you you enjoy the process for yourself, and you eat the food yourself, or you enjoy the process of making music. And I I make music initially for me to listen to, and then, but then the um the real joy comes in like sharing it with people, and then kind of I know like watching my kids eat it see if they like it or whatever and, or like watching people look you know watching people enjoy your music and it becomes part of the world you know mm-hmm. and what i've noticed is like especially younger kids seem to be the harshest critics like when i'm playing oh, it's, it's hard. yeah i'm playing some music like i'll have my my playlist on shuffle and then yeah. one of like the sixth graders i know will be like trashing my music taste the whole time because there's no filter <laughs> which yeah it's a good thing like same whenever I'll, I'll make like a i made a meatball sub and i burned my finger doing it but it was a damn good meatball sub and uh yeah i showed my friend and they're like that looks absolutely horrid but i mean <laughs> that was good to know for next time i mean yeah I but mean, the thing is it. like yeah that's the thing it's like the way the food looks and the way that food tastes is totally separate too you know oh yeah like and that's, is a, yeah it's uh that's that's that's, a, that's another thing it's like because something looks good doesn't mean it's going to be that great, you know, to eat. And just because something looks kind of ordinary doesn't mean it's not going to be delicious. It reminds me of this um, this place in Portland. I can't remember what it's called right now. It'll, it'll maybe come to me. But um, they, they, they make chicken. It's like a, I think a Thai spot. But they only do this chicken, chicken, especially chicken and rice. And um, it doesn't look like that special but it just is incredible like an incredible place um maybe hopefully it'll come to you if there's a comment section (laughs) (laughs) Uh, makes me want to check it out like check my um my texts yeah what it was and that's perfect because it's like um you know when you'll you'll see like a a really beautiful looking cake like all chocolate and it's like decadent and you eat it and it's like, oh, that wasn't as good as I was thinking. It's kind of the same with like album covers, yeah. you know? I mean, you guys have top tier yeah. album covers, but sometimes they'll be like absolutely trash album covers, right? And you listen to the music. Yeah. It's incredible. It's yeah. It's mind blowing <laughs> almost. And then like yeah. sometimes you have the, you know, like the top quality pictures and they went through all that PR and paid all that money to get the best photographers and everything. It's like, wow, that music's kind of, kind of mid but yeah again well, that, it's, it's yeah, a that's, surprise yeah that's that's a that's always disappointing when the the cover is incredible and then the music doesn't live up to it yeah but i think it's like uh yeah i, I suppose it's, it's equally disappointing to me when um 
someone makes a great album and then the cover's not that great because <laughs> I come from a visual art background, you know, so I mm. kind of like think of um, the cover of the record as being like almost as important as the as the music inside, you know. Exactly. So um, I kind of, um, and also I, I'm a big, like when I'm shopping, especially for vinyl, I'll often just, um, I don't like, I'm not the kind of vinyl shopper who will make a list of, you know, things that I want and seek those things out. Usually I just kind of wander around the store looking for things that jump out at me from the packaging. Um, and that's the most enjoyable way to shop for vinyl for me is just to like look for things that look interesting to me. And it's kind of like when I crossed over into doing that, I was really shocked at how um, it never fails me. Like um, maybe it's just because I've spent a long time shopping for music, you know, and mm -hmm. I can just kind of tell by the way that someone's presenting the music that whether I like it or not, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, it's not it's not a one to one. it's not it's not exactly that I like look for the best packaging, um, and that'll be music that I like. It's more like there's just a certain vibe that the packaging will give me, even if it's kind of slightly bad. <laughs> I'll, uh, like this is going to be you know, it's like the when you go to uh, to bring it back to food, it's like. <laughs> You know, sometimes you go to a restaurant and it looks busted and you just, you know, that's going to be the best. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Food ever because it's just, you know, it's like there's certain giveaways um, that a place um, that looks really run down is going to be, going to have, you know, really bomb food or whatever. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> and for me, that. it's like... um like 70s album covers or like the I, I hate to i don't want to like bring hate to an album cover but um sorry my brother's running around to being a total idiot upstairs but um uh was it like queens of the stone age they did their new album and i love queens yeah. they're like my top yeah. i really want to get them on the pod right yeah but dude their new album cover looks not so great <laughs> and it's the same <laughs> with like with genesis album covers Mm -hmm. Like some of those look so dingy, but at the same time, yeah. again, going back to food, right? Like if it's just mm. perfectly dingy, if it's perfect, like it's run down yeah. enough, like, you know, yeah. that's going to be the absolute bomb. And that's the way I feel about those albums. Yeah. They're like they're incredible albums. It could be better. It could be better art, but it adds to it. Yeah. Yeah. Queens of Stone Age, I feel like they're not, um, I feel like Queens of Stone Age is very, eclectic uh has a very eclectic history oh yeah for sure like let's record <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah for sure and that's like the cool thing is same with your guys' record type you can see the uh the transitions like the different musical phases that you're going through like the first record has a nude image on it right and then we transition into like i don't i can't come up with it on top of my head like different album covers and different ideas yeah but I mean that is cool. Yeah, I think right? I think the second album has the second album has nudity. The first album is a building, and the second album has has the um the witch on the cover. I think that's the one you're talking about, and that's like kind of red. Is that what you mean? Uh, for queens? No, no, no. I'm talking. Oh, I, I thought you were talking about UMO. <laughs> oh yeah, no. I mean I see that with UMO uh, too, though. But yeah, yeah. And that is it's um, like. Yeah, I think Queens of the Stone is like I think the thing the from memory, like the the thing that runs through their records that ties them together is kind of like um bold color, like graphic images, a lot of illustrations over photos, right? Mm -hmm. Um symbols, um stuff like that. Yeah, I wonder if they I wonder if all of their records were designed by the same person i don't know i've never looked into that i know that uh, they had like a i forgot the dude's name like bone face or something uh oh, okay. he, he does a lot of the similar art but you know i hope if i get them on the pod i'll make sure to ask him that you know <laughs> yeah 
So uh, here, this is something that, you know, we're going completely off the script, even though I don't really have a script to begin with because I'm a procrastinator, but I don't, you know, this is just, it's nice. And um, something super interesting is I, I love your tattoos and I love tattoos just in general. My mom does not mm -hmm. like tattoos because she's like a, she's a mom, <laughs> but um, yeah. what do you, what do you think tattoos symbolize in terms of artistry? Like, I feel like there's a, certainly a bias, like whenever you say you're a tattoo artist rather than a musician. Some people, you know, shy away. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of dumb, in my opinion. But um, what what other connections do you think there are between tattooing and music? Um, well, I'm not really sure. I suppose the thing, my connection to my first connection to tattoos, was that I went to art school. Hello. Oh. Yep. Yeah. I went to went to art school with uh, uh one one of my closest friends that I went to art school um, with is a tattoo artist and he he's done most of my tattoos and um, so I haven't so I didn't really like when, whenever I come back to New Zealand because um, he was like trying to become better and better at his mm -hmm. at his craft and so it was like kind of almost impossible to spend time with him because he wanted to be tattooing like all day every day and so sometimes like you could hang out with him but you would have to get tattooed and then last time uh last time i was in new zealand um i spent time with him as well but it was um he was tattooing um, one of our crew members um like a giant chest piece oh cool. um, so we were just kind of all sitting around it's like a it's a fun way you know to to hang you know you just kind of yeah. sit around and being tattooed and kind of like talking shit and stuff <laughs> like that um for for me now, tattoos like uh, my one of my things that I always say about tattoos is like you have to um, realize from the beginning that they're a mistake. Like um, th the best tattoo anyone ever got was a mistake, you know. Mm. Um, and once you are, once you kind of like put that behind you, that that's just all a bad idea. Um, I mean, I suppose it's like if you're talking about indigenous uh, tattoos, you, this is a completely different conversation. But just in terms of like regular tattoos that we have in the West as, you know, kind of pictures of skulls and, you know, kind of based on like kind of, ta uh, you know, uh, sailor tattoos and stuff. I think the concept of it is um, make a mistake. And um, but for me now, it's been more about like not what tattoos like symbolize anything other than that they represent um the flow of time mm. um that you know you get um a tattoo when you're you get a tattoo when you're like 22 say and then you get it and then you get a tattoo in your 40s or whatever it's like th there's going to be time between those two things right and they the, the decisions you would make to what tattoo you would get when you're in your 20s is when you're in your 40s would be totally different and the tattoo itself will be literally be faded and like yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. spread out and fade you know it's like um um you know and i've always kind of like like the idea of being one of those guys that's like an old man and has a bunch of like blue tattoos all over his body you know and they just and they kind of remind you you know, of, of certain times in your life, you know, like I've got this, this is a mistake I made at 21. <laughs> this is a mistake I made at 28. This is a mistake I made at, you know, 35, you know, and throughout your life, you kind of um, accumulate all of these mistakes and they kind of like all kind of um, take you back. It, it's kind of like another thing that connects to music, you know, like a lot of the reason that I make bright songs is to um, remember a, uh, a day or remember a a period of time and have um a kind of time um capsule that i can go back to um to remind me of a certain time of my life remind me of a certain relationship or um a certain painful time or um a certain person or you know these things where you can kind of like put the song on and then um and then go back to that time you know there's a lot of pieces of music that I try not to listen to uh, too much because I don't want to wear them out, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, because I know that if I put them on, 
then um, then I'll be able to go back to this place and it might be a totally different country, a totally different decade. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's become tattoos for me too. You know, I, I get tattoos that specifically are really just there to prompt my memory and keep me from forgetting uh, certain things that happened. And, and it ties to photography too, because I, that's why I started taking um, film is because I just thought it was an, an interesting way to get into a new thing, like a new hobby, you know, but also um, I kind of found that the pictures on my phone, they just don't evoke, they're not as evocative as the ones that I've taken with a film camera. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking that's really, really weird that film is closer to memory than than the pictures I take on my phone. I, I don't really understand that. And I really don't really, I, I'm scared of appearing super pretentious by saying that, but I just find it's true. Like I just find that, um, that film, the way it kind of captures light sometimes, I just, it takes me back to the memory. Whereas the phone, I don't know what the phone does, but the phone changes, it changes the way that, image looks and then when I look at the picture on my phone uh, it doesn't take me back to the moment in the same way that film does and, and I don't really don't know how to explain that and I, I hope that I don't come across like a <laughs> pretentious douchebag by, by, by saying that but it's just sort of something that I've noticed yeah no it's totally true and uh I love your I love your philosophy about tattooing because um you know I'm sure I'll get a uh important meaningful tattoos or mistake somewhat later in my life or sooner, <laughs> wherever it happens. But I love that, you know, because that's, that really is true. You know, like, I, um, well, it was like my first time away from home, like three years ago, uh, yeah. at a summer camp. And one of my friends yeah. bought a, a dingy $40 Polaroid. And there's this Polaroid yeah. of, it's like a picture that I still have of me after we hiked a mountain like this, yeah. and you cannot see shit. It's entirely <laughs> black. It's completely <laughs> black. And um, I cherish it so much. Like I have yeah. that on my wall, and I just remember, you know, wow, I was that was a sweaty day. It was a hundred degrees. We did the hike, yeah. and I was pissed that you could not see me in the goddamn photo. But, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's funny that you don't even you can't even see it. I mean, it's just like that. That stuff becomes more and more valuable. I think the older you get, where you realize like you have all these memories, and you got to have a way to like index those memories. Like yeah, give yeah. your brain, uh, give your brain like a pathway, um, to to feel the way you did on that day again. Because you you know the the older you get, the more you have all these intense um experiences and memories and stuff, and and it's it's easy to lose track of them, you know. So it's nice to have yeah. uh, these ways of of keep, you know plugging you back in. Mm -hmm. I completely agree, and um. So this is it. I've got a minute left and Zoom is going to kick me out. I say this every cool. single interview. <laughs> Zoom, give yeah. me free, give me the unlimited por favor. Uh, this is so yeah. dumb. So I've got I've got less than 60 seconds left. It's like the Green Day thing. It's so this is so dumb. Yeah. But um well, I, I should think, um I should cook uh, dinner for my kids anyway. So yeah. So um it's probably a good idea. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been a complete honor and a pleasure. Hopefully you'll no be problem, back in Atlanta Jack. sooner enough. Uh I'm going to go to Heaps Pies, like you said. Uh, and yeah. it looks like it's daytime where you're at. So have a wonderful day. Yeah. Okay. You too, man. If, if I ever uh, see the Queens of Stonehenge, I'll, I'll put in a good word for you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. See you, man. See ya.